Welcome and this is a review for Unit 1, Basic Chemistry and Water Properties. We started the unit by talking about matter and we know that matter can be broken to its smallest part, um, parts and that's an atom. And uh, we have um, the atom being subdivided into three parts. We have the protons being the positive particles, we have the electrons being the negative, and then we have the neutrons being the uh, neutral part of the atom. Uh, if you can see here, the electrons are um, orbiting the nucleus, and the nucleus has the protons and the neutrons in it. We then took a look at the periodic table of elements, and we noticed that the periodic table of elements can be uh, grouped in a particular way. We have periods going from left to right and then we have the groups and we took a look at the first, uh, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth group. We didn't talk much about these elements because we wanted to see the patterns on the first um, 18 elements. Okay. We practice doing some Bohr diagrams, and the Bohr diagrams basically shows all the electrons in their shells. And notice that the outer shell is dotted, or is a dashed line, and that's uh, we call valence shell. And a valence shell is the outer shell. Okay, so valence just means outer. We then took a look at the Lewis dot diagram and we saw that it shows only the electrons in the outer shell, or the valence electrons, the one in the outer shell. And these are just examples of carbon and chlorine. Um, uh, you should have gotten these results for the patterns in the periodic table. Notice that the first period only contains one shell. So the first period only has one shell. And then the second period has two shells for all the elements on there. And then the third period has three shells where we place the val uh, the electrons. If you take a look at the valence electron, we have one here, one here, and one here, so one valence electron, which matches the number of the group. So that's group one. And then group two has two valence electrons. Okay, and group three, if you notice, if you count the red dots, you have three right here. Okay. And if you go ahead and uh, group four would have four valence electrons. Five has uh, five, six, seven, and eight. So why are these patterns important? We wanted to see uh, how electrons behave. So we have the the ones that are metals are the best electron givers. And these are all the metals in red. And the ones that are in blue right here, those are uh, non-metals. So the nonmetals are best electron takers. They will accept that electron to become more stable. Now atoms can also gain an electron and if you take a look at chlorine in a neutral state, it is missing one electron be to become completely uh, to complete its shell. So it gains an electron from another atom, and if you count the atom, uh, the electrons here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, uh, that's a pretty happy and stable chlorine atom.
okay now since it gained an electron it has a charge so we put a negative charge right there okay so atoms can also lose an electron and in this case we have sodium and sodium um, needs to get rid of that in order to be more stable so loses outer electron becomes a charged particle a charged atom or a charged ion and it's a positive ion in this case okay this is just an example of a neutral atom uh, we have uh, sodium and this is basically how you find it on the periodic table and chlorine um, is missing or it just needs one to complete its outer shell. Now this is an example of a charged atom and we have sodium right here and sodium um, has lost that extra electron that it really didn't want and chloride or chlorine has become chloride a chloride ion and it has a negative charge because it accepted that extra electron that it needed to complete its outer shell. An ionic bond would be formed by the attraction between two oppositely charged ions and in this case we have a sodium ion and this one has a positive charge and it is attracted to chloride which now has a negative charge. So the attraction between them, the attract attractive forces are ionic forces. And that's how a, an ionic bond is formed. Now a covalent bond would be the sharing of electrons between atoms and an example of it would be methane. And we have the sharing right here. Hydrogen is pretty happy because it has that outer shell completed with two. And remember, hydrogen would only have one uh, outer shell because it only has one, um, only one valence electron. Now, carbon has four, and it has been able to pair it up with um, four hydrogen so that it completes its outer shell with eight electrons, and that makes it pretty happy. Now, another type of attraction between molecules would be the one that we call hydrogen bond and it's uh, indicated by the dashed lines and it's between two water molecules at least two water molecules don't confuse it with a covalent bond which is uh, part of the water molecule is what attaches the hydrogen to the oxygen now we take a uh, we took a look at one of the molecules that make life possible on this planet and that's the water molecule and we know that it has a bunch of properties or characteristics and that's due to its polarity and polarity just means that the molecule has a charge on a different charge on either side so we have a positive side uh, and we also have a negative side and that we call polarity. Now we also observe another kind of attraction and this is uh, the hydrogen bond and it's a form between two, at least two water molecules and it's the attraction of the negative side towards the positive side of another water molecule. Now as a side note I just wanted to point out that uh, water molecules are moving and they are dissociating or breaking apart and reforming and this is constantly so that's why we have the double arrows indicating that this is happening all the time now cohesion and adhesion cohesion is basically the attraction between two water molecules so same substances uh, attracting each other and adhesion would be um, in this case water molecule attracted to another surface or another substance in this case we have the leaf and water being just attaching to the leaf and we also had uh, the penny lab where we saw that uh, water also ad ad um, was attracted to the surface of the penny and to itself surface tension is caused by the cohesion forces that gives water a very high surface tension and we saw it with a paper clip in the, in the water lab 
and we saw that um, we also saw the benefits for the organisms in nature um, especially insects they are able to um, to just walk on water or just lay it on water so that's a surface that they can land on now we also saw capillary action and capillary action is due to adhesion and cohesion forces it allows water to climb up and we see that in this diagram adhesion would be adhering to the side of the tube and cohesion is just water molecules attaching to another water molecule and this is important because this is how water gets up to the top of a tree it's through the xylem and the xylem are these tiny tiny tubes inside the tissue of a plant now there's an experiment that you can do where you can put color water and you can see how the plant or the celery will absorb that color water uh, and that's an example of capillary action now high specific heat just means that water will take a long time to heat and a long time to cool and you can see this uh, with this diagram water will boil at 100 degrees celsius while alcohol will boil sooner than that in this graph you can see what happens at each stage of um, the phases of water uh, whenever you see like this part where it's flat we see that it's a constant temperature and temperature doesn't change and that's because the heat is going into the phase change and that means that it's breaking the hydrogen bond so it's not going into changing the temperature it's just uh, the heat is being used to break uh, breaking of hydrogen bonds all right and that's why we don't see the temperature change uh, for a period of time it, it keeps boiling and it doesn't raise the temperature uh, at one point it does and it becomes steam and then the heat goes into temperature change now temperature is the measure of uh, how fast atoms of a substance are moving and uh, obviously in the hot water they're moving very fast in cold water they're not moving as fast now how can we use high specific heat of water for an advantage and we know farmers already do that whenever we know that there's gonna be a freeze uh, they will spray water on the plants the water will change into ice and it will release heat the plant will absorb that heat and it will keep it from the freezing point we also use water as an effective coolant and our bodies know that because uh, whenever we sweat water is released and it, once it evaporates it will take the heat with it and we also use it to um, keep us warm as well so we have water um, being less dense as a solid and what that means is that if you take a look at the molecules in that area you have less water molecules compared to its liquid form there's many more it's much more dense than the ice so if we take a look at ice ice will be less dense than warm water and cold water will be uh, much more dense than the other two now the benefit of ice being less dense than liquid water is that it can protect or it won't kill the marine organisms it will float on top of uh, liquid water and during the winter and it will serve as an insulator and just imagine if ice was to sink to the bottom it will eventually kill everything and it would uh, just freeze the lake solid so it's a good thing that water is more dense than ice and ice gets to um, float on top of the water now floating ice serves also as a habitat for animals and this is where the polar bears live and also another benefit of ice floating is that imagine if uh, all the ice was to uh, sink to the bottom it would uh, raise the level of the sea and it uh, would affect the shoreline we might not have um, Miami on the map if ice was to just sink to the bottom 
Ice is also important for animals. Uh, we have in the South Pole, we have uh, penguins that um, slide on the ice. And we also have in the North Pole, we have the seals where, um, where they can breed and they can uh, keep their young protected from other predators. Now water is considered to be a universal solvent and you can see that with salt crystals whenever you mix salt and water. Water is the solvent and notice how the particles, the water particles will surround and break apart the, the salt. Types of mixtures and just to uh, give you an idea here, solutions is a type of mixture and uh, we have a solvent in this case this would be water and we have a solute in this case if you take a look over here that would be sugar another type of mixture is a suspension and that would be a mixture of uh, sand and water and eventually if you leave it alone it will settle down to the bottom so that's what a suspension is it's a type of mixture and um, the particles are much bigger than in a solution, eventually you will be able to uh, see them if you leave them undisturbed. Now we have acids and bases, and an acid would be a substance that when added to water, it produces the positive hydrogen ions, and the base would be a substance which when added to water, produces the hydroxide ion. On this side we have the pH scale and it gives us an idea of what is a base and what is uh, an acidic or an acid. And we have lemon juice on one side. And I just wanted to point out that neutral would be 7 and most life likes to have a pH of 6.5, between 6.5 and 8.2. Notice that human blood is 7.5. The pH scale can also be uh, described as how many positive ions it has and how many negative ions it has. So the bases will have more of the OH negative ions and the acids will have more of those H plus ions in it. Now remember that I told you that most life forms enjoy having a neutral pH. Uh, between 7 and 8 more or less and we know that the body actually produces a buffer to keep certain things uh, neutral and an example of that would be carbonic acid and that keeps our blood at a constant pH of 7.4 so that's a good thing for our bodies. Now another buffer produced by the body is sodium bicarbonate and it's produced or secreted by the pancreas and the way it works is that once the stomach is done digesting and breaking apart our food, it moves into the intestines and the pancreas neutralizes those acids um, before it continues into the intestines. And finally, we have the pharmaceutical buffers and these are sold to the consumers in order to control heartburns and any large amount of stomach acids. I hope the review has been helpful, and if you have any questions, please make sure that you post them. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in class. Bye-bye.